Church. All right, let's go. I'm loving this series. What about you? That didn't, I'm loving this series. What about you? Let's go. That's awesome. Hey, we are in this series called Mosaic. Let me hear you say Mosaic. And, and, and mosaic is just this idea that a picture, a mosaic is made up of smaller images that, that form into this larger image when you can take a step back and look at the fullness of the image. And so what we've been doing over the course of the series is just taking maybe some of our limited understanding, our limited beliefs about Jesus, about some of his titles, about why he came, and we're painting this larger picture so that we can see the fullness of the beauty and the grandeur and the majesty of God. And so today, as Sean was saying a little bit earlier, we're going to look at this idea, this mosaic piece of Lamb of God. Now, now if I'm honest, this one, it, it's, if, especially if you're from the outside looking in, it feels a little odd, like Lamb of God. Most of us don't have a lamb in our front yard or our backyard, right? I mean, we don't really know what they are. And, and one of the things when you see Lamb of God, it means sacrifice. We're going to talk about blood today. Now, now blood is just one of those things that makes us uncomfortable, doesn't it? Like some of you, when you see blood or hear about blood, like you just pass out. Like you can't go to the doctor. They have to have a nurse to hold you up. Uh, blood can just be awkward. And quite honestly, there are some times when I look at Christianity, I'm like, God, couldn't you have done a, a little different way? Like, what about, you know, the Buddhists? Couldn't we have like transcendental meditation and reach nirvana? Like, couldn't it be something easier than talking about blood because it, it can be a little awkward? You know, I can remember when my, when my daughter was really young, she was young enough where she could sit on my shoulder. She was about four and uh, we were walking through the mall and we had taught her some hymns and there was this one hymn that was a really old hymn, you know, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Anybody remember that hymn? Yeah. And so I had taught her this, one of the first, you know, because I'm an awesome parent. And so we're walking through the mall. She starts singing the song. I'm like, this is awesome. I like my daughter singing the hymn. It's amazing. And then she says, sing it, daddy. I'm like, in the mall? You want me to sing about blood in the mall? Like it just, it feels a little bit awkward, but here's what I believe today. And here's what I hope to show you today. And here's what I hope God reveals to you today. is just when we begin to understand and we begin to track and understand everything that Jesus sacrificed meant for us, the reason why God did it that way will be the most perfect, amen? right? It will be the most beautiful and it will be the most effective. So that's what we're going to unpack today. So let's grab our Bibles. We're going to be in the book of John, the book of John. We're going to start in chapter one. Now, again, John, he was a contemporary of Jesus. He was one of Jesus' early followers. He started following Jesus as a, as a teenager. And so he was there throughout all of Jesus' ministry. He was there to see uh, the miracles that Jesus performed. He was there to be an eyewitness to the things that Jesus said and the things that Jesus taught. Uh, John was part of a, he was one of the leaders of the early church. John, the author, actually was, lived the longest of all of the apostles. So he saw more th literally than any of the apostles that followed Jesus. He saw the effect of what it meant to follow Jesus more than anybody. And so John is writing these words. There's also another person in the story, a guy named John the Baptist. And those are two different people. Don't want you to be confused. There's John the author and John the Baptist. John the Baptist actually was born to prepare the way of Jesus. He, he was born to tell people, hey, he's coming. That's the one you should follow. You know, the one who fulfills all the promises, you know, the one you've been looking for, the, you know, the one you've anticipated, that's him. You need to follow him. And this is John the Baptist's role in the story. And so John, the author is writing this about John the Baptist, John chapter one, and we're going to start out in verse 29. <coughs> Excuse me. It says the next day he saw Jesus, meaning John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him. And he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself didn't know him, but for this purpose, I came baptizing with water that he, Jesus, might be revealed to Israel. So this is why Jesus came, uh, John the Baptist came so that Jesus would be revealed uh, to all of Israel. So, so in order to understand this whole idea of Jesus being the Lamb of God, we got to go back to the beginning of the story, okay? Now, Israel was based on a sacrificial system. Now, we, we don't all, you know, kind of get that because probably none of us have experienced that unless maybe you've traveled overseas on a mission trip or something. Um, but they were built on this. 
And, and this idea of sacrifice goes all the way back to the beginning. Now, now there's something that we have to hang on to if we're going to really understand and experience the full life that God has for us. And it's this statement here. There is a God and he is good. There is a God and he is good. Now, now sometimes we, we don't hang on to this because we, our circumstances aren't good. So we believe God isn't good. So the battle many times is to hang on to this fundamental belief, this fundamental truth that there is a God and he is good. Because sometimes we don't think God's good because you look at something and you're like, I wouldn't do it that way. Well, how's that gone for you the rest of your life? <laughs> like we look at it in our failed and fallen nature and we think we wouldn't do it a certain way as if God knows less than we do. But, but if we can just put all other beliefs about God aside just for the next 25 minutes, there is a God and he is good. And God created the world. We know that in the beginning, God created everything. God created heaven and earth. He created plants and animals. He created, you know, sunsets and sunrises and the moon. He created the stars in space. And, and he created Adam and Eve. And he said this, he says, it is good, man. This is good. All of his creation was good. And, and we know, though, that that's not the way it still is, right? Like, we know that there is a problem. And that problem is called sin. So, Because here's what Adam and Eve do. You know, God tells Adam, he says, there's a tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't eat from that one. Like everything else, knock, knock yourself out. Eat of everything else, enjoy yourself, be fruitful, multiply, bring order to the world. This is your job, this is your role. And it's still, still our role today. But Adam and Eve were just to go and just to prepare and to order everything God had created. It says that they were naked and they felt no shame. Just this idea, they didn't, they had no sin in them, that they were clean. And we know that Satan comes and he tempts Adam and Eve and they both sin. They both eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and that obviously presents a, a large problem. In Genesis chapter three, we, we see the effects of that. After they'd sin, it says in verse eight, it says, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife, that's Adam and Eve, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among all the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard, you, I heard the sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And so in that, we see the fall of man, right? We see that we all live like that. I mean, we're all hiding something. We're all trying not to be discovered. We're all, we all feel a sense of shame, feel a sense of regret. And, and it's no shock that you come to church and hear the word sin, correct? I can remember when I first gave my life to Christ, I was in my mid-20s and I was working at an insurance company. And I was talking to a guy there um, at the company, uh, Brad, about Jesus and talking about sacrifice and talking about sin. He's like, I just don't feel like you should tell people, and especially kids, that, that they're sin. I'm like, they already know, don't they? They already know something is wrong. I'm not telling them what the problem is. I'm telling them about the solution. And until we understand the fundamental problem, we'll never get to a solution. You know why you feel insecurity and anxiety and stress? Why? Feel like something's missing? Feel like there's more? Because there is. It's because there's sin in the world. So sin comes, and sin is not just as simple as eating the bite of an apple like we would want to make it seem. Man, sin is cosmic in nature. Sin alienates us from the giver of life, God himself. And this is the fundamental problem. Man, sin affects everything in our lives. Think about the weather for a minute. Like the, the Bible says that all of creation groans because it's been thrown into chaos because of sin. So when you see a hurricane, you should think to yourself, not why would God do that, but how devastating does sin have to be that this happens? Like when you see tragedies happen in the world, you should not think to yourself, what's God up to? You should think to yourself, how bad does sin have to be for this to be the outcome? Man, it was a cosmic rip in the universe, and we all have suffered the consequences of it. It's not just as simple as our behavior. Because if it were just our behavior, we could, we could fix that. Let's be honest. Like, we could read some habit books and get it done. But it's our posture towards God that's the problem. That we want to be our own boss. We want to do things our way. That we want to be independent. And we think we have a better way. And we think God's holding out on us, which is what Adam and Eve thought. And so there is sin 
in the world that has alienated us, alienated us, and everything that sin touches faces disintegration. Everything. I think about some, some areas of your life and how sin just disintegrates it. I mean, think about this one. This, this one's socially acceptable. Overwork. What, what about the sin of overwork? It's, it disintegrates your health when you overwork. It disintegrates your family when you overwork. It disintegrates your uh, relationships, your friends when you over. It disintegrates everything in our life. What about holding a grudge? Do you know that physically your body breaks down when you harbor a grudge and don't offer forgiveness to people? Man, that you think you're holding it against them, but actually you're holding it against you. And it just disintegrates everything about our lives and about our world. Now, God steps in to give a solution to the problem and offer forgiveness. So let me ask you this question. Like, where do you need forgiveness? What, what thought plays over and over in your mind? Like, what regret do you just seem to live with all the time? What, what seems like it goes in the room before you anytime you enter into a room? Have you noticed how great we are at binge watching? Man, we binge watch Ted Lasso or we'll binge watch Breaking Bad. But you know what we binge watch more than anything? Our past, our sin, our mistakes, the negative things about our life. It's why it takes seven positive compliments to overcome one negative comment. And we just replay it over and over and over again. Like, where do you need forgiveness? Now, God provides it. Watch what happens in verse 21 of chapter 3. It says that, that God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins, and he clothed them. So God, through no fault of his own, has this breach now with Adam and Eve. And there's a problem. And now they know that they're naked, so God provides covering for them when, when they're the ones who caused it in the first place. You see, our understanding of sacrifice actually probably originates um, in, when we studied the Greek gods when we were in school. That there's a God up there in heaven and he's angry at you and he wants to punish you. And he's going to put the bolt of lightning on you if you get out. If you just can live right, sacrifice right, maybe you'll escape being noticed by him. And we kind of translate that onto the Bible like God's angry with us and he sent Jesus to, to kill Jesus, not us, so that we could have life. But that's not God's posture. Man, God's posture is to provide a solution. God's posture is actually to, to love us. God's posture toward us is good, not bad. And so we don't have to sacrifice. Now, now we might not sacrifice animals, but let's be honest, we're sacrificing. Like you're sacrificing something. And for most of us in this room, for most people, what we're trying to sacrifice to prove ourselves to God, to cover our sin, do you know what it is? Our good works, the good stuff that we do. Because we all, we all want to do good stuff. Like, you want, you, want to, you want to do good things. Like, you serve because you, you know that that's a positive thing to do. Man, you, you want to be a good husband or a good wife because you want to be looked at and you want God to smile on you. you, you you're at all, every one of your kids' sporting events and practices and whatever. You volunteer at their school. You give some money. You probably even started your own 501c3. And part of that, re, the motivation for you is like, I've just got to do good so God will be good to me. Listen, we do those things not so God will love us, but because God loves us. And we don't have to sacrifice anymore because the sacrifice has already been made. And every sacrifice we see in the Bible actually points to Jesus. This is the first one in the Garden of Eden. And then we see them begin to just unfold over and over and over again throughout the Bible. Now, the sacrifice that we make actually should be gratitude for what God has done. In Psalm chapter 50, it says, The one who offers thanksgiving as the sacrifice actually glorifies me. Like the thanksgiving to God is what we, he, he's not looking for us to prove ourselves. He's not looking for us to achieve anything. He's not looking for us to do good things. That's just an outgrowth of the life that we have because we've been forgiven. But man, just to say thank you and to live lives full of gratitude to God for what he's done in our life. So as you think about the good things that you do, what's motivating you? Like what's your motivation to do good stuff? 
Is it so God will be pleased with you? Or maybe not even that. Maybe it's so God won't be angry with you and punish you. Is it so your Thanksgiving will go conflict free? Like, like what is it? What's your motivation? Now, when we think about sacrifice, when we see sacrifice in the Bible, we see a literal animal sacrifice and we see that blood was spilled. And so here's where we get into a little bit of the, oh, what is, what is up with the blood thing in Christianity? Because think about it. If you're from the inside and you've grown up hearing about the blood of Jesus, like no big deal, right? It's just what we do. It's who we are. It's how we talk. It's the way we think. It's what's taught. It's just, it just is. But if you're coming from the outside, like how odd does that have to be for you? Like you grew up in some other context and you're kind of spiritually figuring it out and you walk into a church and they start celebrating and singing about the blood of Jesus. Got to be a little odd. Let me explain it for you, okay? Now, in the book of Leviticus, chapter 17, this is a place in the Bible we begin to see this idea of sacrifice happening. And in, in, in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, it says this. It says, the life of the flesh is in the blood. So hold on, let me stop there. And I know you're going to want to read the rest of it because that's what you are, you're overachievers. But let me talk through this. As a matter of fact, take it off the screen for just a second. All right. The life of the flesh is in the blood. You know this physically. Life is in the blood. When you go to the, get a physical at the doctor, what do they do? They do Blood work. Why? To see if your blood has anything in it that's going to cause death. Man, your blood carries oxygen. It carries carbon dioxide away. It carries nutrients. If there's a problem, it's going to show up in your blood. You get blood work. Like whenever you go, and maybe you, you don't even feel bad, but you notice when, that something will come up in your blood work that tells you that you're sick. Life is in the blood. If I were to cut you, if I were to cut myself right here, right now, and I would never do that. And some of you thinking of me do that, right? You're feeling a little queasy. If I were to cut myself, the problem would not be that my skin is broken. The problem would be is that I'm losing blood. Life is in the blood. This is the way God is created physically, but also it points to a spiritual reality. All right, back to verse 11. It says, the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. So, so here's the thing. Life is in the blood. So when blood is, get, when, when we sin, what happens is we're spiritually dead. So something has to pay for that. So what, the way God has designed it, and part of the reason we have blood in the first place is that it points out the gravity of sin. The reason why we have blood and life is in the blood is for us to know the significance of sin. So when the nation of Israel would sacrifice an animal, and they would see the blood that was put on the altar, it would be a deterrent for sin because they would recognize every time that sin causes death and something has got to die in order for me to have life. So it was a deterrent. It also was symbolic of spiritually washing us, that we are spiritually dirty, we're spiritually broken, we're spiritually unclean when we sin and separate ourselves from God, the giver of life. And so what blood does, it's just this idea that we're cleansed. It's a deterrent from sin, but also a detergent that cleanses us from sin. Now, the writer of Hebrews tells us that like, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. This is the way God has set it up because sin is so devastating. And in this sentence, this is where grace and truth both come together. That sin has happened, right? That's truth. God in his glory and perfection and justice has to do something with that. He knows that we can't. So what does he do? He provides a sacrifice and every sacrifice points to Jesus. And we have no more sacrifice because Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. So this is the way the world works. Now in the Bible, there's some different kinds of sacrifices. Um, have you ever heard, how many of you have heard of the word scapegoat? Okay, a few of you, most of you. It originates in the Bible, right? Now, scapegoat, think about some scapegoats that we know in history. You know, Yoko Ono, responsible for breaking up the Beatles. She's a scapegoat. Uh, Mrs. O'Leary's cow, the Chicago Fire. You know, we know people that are a scapegoat. They get the blame, even though they shouldn't have gotten the blame. So here's how it happens in the Bible. They would bring two goats into the camp. And one goat would be the physical sacrifice. They would kill the goat, they would spread its blood, and that would be the sacrifice. The other goat, the scapegoat, the priest would lay hands on the head of that goat, and he would symbolically transfer all the sins of the nation of Israel from them onto this goat. Then they would send the goat out into the wilderness, send him away, send the goat away, just like our sins are removed from us. This is where we get the term scapegoat. 
It comes from the sacrificial system that was in the nation of Israel before Christ. Now, now the primary animal that was used for sacrifice and the name that John gives Jesus is Lamb of God. Lamb of God. Like, where does that come from? Glad you asked. Let me help you because this is where it's going to get good. Okay, the, in, in the Bible, you may remember the story of uh, the prince of Egypt, Moses. Now, the nation of Israel finds themselves in slavery in Egypt, roughly three million Jews in Egypt. And God looks at them and God says, I, I'm ready for you guys to be free. So he appoints Moses. Moses is a figure of Jesus, a better Jesus, to go and to secure their release to go to the Pharaoh, who's the king, the king of Egypt. He goes there to secure their release. But the Pharaoh's like, no way, Jose. Like, we're, we're not doing that. This is not going to happen. That's our economic engine. We're not, we're not doing anything with them. They are staying in slavery. So here's what God does. God sends 10 plagues, like 10 commandments, 10 plagues. You see the symbolism there. And these plagues are intended to convince Pharaoh, the king, that he needs to let the people go. Now, each of the ten actually targets one of the gods that Egypt worships. So he sends, you know, blood in the Nile. He sends frogs that go everywhere. He sends uh, flies and he sends locusts. He sends boils on their skin. Man, he sends darkness. He sends yeah, locusts to destroy the crops. Man, he sends a plague that kills the beasts of the field. Um, and, and he sends nine of these plagues. And after nine, you would think they'd have learned a lesson, right? <laughs> you would think they'd be like, all right, we're out. Like, go on. We'll figure it out. Man, we'll come up with some other industry. But they still are stubborn. They still won't believe. So he sends the, then he sends the last one. And this is where we get our Passover from. Now, the last plague goes a little like this. The nation of Israel was instructed to take a lamb and to sacrifice it, to kill it. And they would place some of the blood on the, the door frame and on, on the sides of the door posts and above on the door frame, three places. And death would come through the nation of Egypt. And anybody that had blood on the doorposts would be passed over. They would live. But anybody who didn't, the firstborn in that house would die. And so what we see is the nation of Egypt didn't put blood on their doorposts. They didn't sacrifice the Passover lamb. And so all the firstborn in the nation of Egypt died. Now, you may think that seems severe. No, 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 don't forget. We can't, we can't underestimate the gravity of sin. And this is what happens. And so God passes over the nation of Israel because of the Passover lamb. Then they institute this Passover celebration, remembrance, memorial every single year. And they, they sacrifice the Passover lamb. And it is the highest to the nation of Israel. Now, this is what John is referencing Jesus to be, the Passover lamb. Now, now, now think about this for a minute. First of all, firstborn, Jesus was God's firstborn son, only son, it says. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. The lamb that was sacrificed had to be spotless. It had to be perfect. It could have no broken bones. We know that Jesus lived a perfect life. That, that Jesus, even when he was being crucified, that while he hung on the cross, normally what the Roman government would do is they would take a hammer and they would break the legs of the criminal so that they couldn't hold themselves up to catch their breath. But they didn't do that with Jesus. That they shoved a spear in his side underneath his rib cage, piercing his heart sack to be sure that he dead, died, all the while fulfilling the prophecy that he would be the Passover lamb with no broken bones. He was at Passover, the time of sacrifice was three o'clock in the afternoon. And Jesus at three o'clock, the Bible records, dies on the cross and says these words, it 
is finished. This is, this is the, the Passover lamb. You see that the blood that was, that was spread on the doorpost, both sides and above, in the shape of what? A cross. And then maybe, maybe most amazing to me is where the Passover lamb would come from. You see, the Passover lamb, in order to be perfect, spotless, no broken bones, had to be raised in a certain way, in a certain environment. And there were certain rules that had to happen. And there was a certain location where the Passover lamb had to be, had to be raised. Are you ready for this? The Passover lamb had to be raised in Bethlehem. So, so when you hear the Christmas story this year, it's going to say, hey, there was some shepherds in a field nearby keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around about them and they were terrified. You know what sheep those shepherds were raising? Passover lambs. And what city was Jesus born in? Bethlehem. Because that's where the Passover lamb had to be, had to be born. Like you can't make this up. So God provides the Passover lamb. Jesus goes to the cross as the ultimate sacrifice. And the sacrificial system has been completed. That we have the life of Christ. We have the forgiveness of sins. When we follow Jesus, we don't have anything holding us back. Now, now there's certain things that this means for us. Number one, we have forgiveness of sin. So you know that sin that you think about? The reason why you try to avoid church a lot of times, the things that you want to tell anybody, the things that come up even when I say the words and for the last 20 some odd minutes, you haven't heard anything I've said about lambs or sacrifices. You've just thought about that sin. Forgiven if you follow Jesus. This gives us a new identity. You see, prior to Jesus, prior to following Jesus, sin is actually the truest thing about us. It's the thing that's governing our lives and ruling us. That's what the Bible teaches us, man. Sin is like this burden that we bear. It's like leprosy, the Bible will tell us, that is just destroying our limbs, destroying our soul. It's like a lion seeking to devour us. It's like rebellion. It's also like adultery. And all those images come together and we are forgiven. If you're forgiven by Jesus, sin is not the truest thing about you. God's grace is the truest thing about you. Listen, you've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Man, you're no longer dead, but you are alive. Man, you, you, you're adopted as a son or a daughter. Like you, you're going to receive a full inheritance as a son. Like this is your new identity. It helps you live with a certain level of confidence. It helps you to stop being afraid of what other people think so much. You know, another, another image that we have of forgiveness is this idea of just this, our stain being removed, being washed clean, that you don't have to live a life with any more regrets. You, you, you know, what, what Satan wants to do to you, he wants to influence your thoughts to think about the, the things that you've done, that you would disqualify yourself from ever living the life of, of purpose and freedom and joy that God wants you to live. So Satan's going to remind you. Satan's going to remind you of the things that you've done that are going to hold you back. And he wants to use your past against you. But Jesus, man, he wants to use your past for you. He wants to restore that. Man, he wants to, he wants to use it to help somebody else. He doesn't want it to hold you back anymore. Man, you're healed. You're healed because our hearts are broken this is the image that we have. You know, when we think of broken heart, what we think of is, is our girlfriend broke of us when we were 14. And then, oh, he's got a broken heart, got his first broken heart. No, literally in the Bible, broken heart, the image is like a stick that breaks or something in us that shatters when we're disconnected from God, when we're not attached to the giver of life, and that God comes in to heal that. Have you ever had this feeling, part of me wants to and part of me doesn't? Like that's just this indication, man, that there's something broken inside, something's going on inside that we need to be healed from. Man, we get power over sinful behavior. You know, we think we can do a lot of things on our own power. Why is it that you keep saying that? Why is it that you keep embellishing the truth? Like, why is it that you keep getting angry when you know you shouldn't? Listen, I've read every book on habits in the world, probably. 
And it's nothing compared to the power of God changing your heart. Listen, some of us, maybe, maybe you need to go to counseling to get some help, to get through some things. But I would just encourage you, don't go to a counselor who's not going to deal with the forgiveness of sin. He's not going to point you to the cross. He's not going to help you understand the power that comes through the forgiveness that only God can offer you where you can quit making the sacrifices that you're trying to make. We are reconciled to God. Man, we're reconciled to God. He was our substitute. He was our atonement. We can pray to God. God's ever-present help us. Listen, when you feel like God's holding out on you, he's not. When you feel like you're deficient or defective, you're, you are, but everybody is. When you feel like it's just you, it's not. It's not just you, man. We have been reconciled to God. And this is going to carry us into eternity. You know, John also wrote a book in the Bible called Revelation. And Revelation just paints this picture of the end. And we know that Jesus is coming back as a conqueror. But the primary word for Jesus isn't conqueror in the book of Revelation. We know he's coming back as a king, king of kings. But the primary word in the book of Revelation is not king. He's coming back as Lord of Lords. We'll talk about that in another week. That, that's not the primary word that's used for Jesus in the book of Revelation. The primary word for Jesus, you guessed it, lamb. The lamb that we will celebrate and worship throughout all eternity. And as you look at Revelation, I'm going to read uh, Revelation chapter 5. In Revelation chapter 5, Starts in verse 11. <clears throat> it says, I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads or thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice. Now notice this is one voice. Thousands and thousands and thousands of creatures with one voice saying what? Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne, to the lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Like this is the image of what Jesus did for us, that he came and he died for us and he died the death that we couldn't die so that we could live the life that we couldn't live. Man, and he will be worshiped in eternity as the Lamb of God. We will never forget the image of the Lamb because it will be in front of us. And we will, our hearts will be so full of gratitude for what he's done. Listen, it should cause us today. It should cause us to sin less, but to be more aware. And as I get older, man, I'm, I, I hope that I'm sinning less. But I'm definitely more aware of the gravity of sin. Revelation chapter 12, <clears throat> verse 10 says this. John is writing this again. He says, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers, that's Satan, he has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. That is Satan's job. He's standing before God accusing you and he's accusing you in your own mind. And guess who's not listening to it? God, and neither should you. He will be thrown down. He's been conquered. It says this, they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. Man, they conquered him by the blood of the lamb. Jesus came that we forgive. The word of their testimony, the testimony that they followed Jesus. When, when someone would ask them, if someone were to ask them who they were, I mean, they were a follower of Jesus. That's their primary identity. And then finally over in Revelation chapter 22, or tw actually in, in Revelation chapter 21, John writes this, he says, I saw no temple in the city for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty and the Lamb. Now think about it, the temple was the place where they worshiped. The temple was the place where they sacrificed. So what John is saying is the temple, we don't even need a temple anymore. We have God himself. We have the Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. Like this is who we have in our presence. He says, the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it. This is amazing for the glory of God gives its light and its lamp is the lamb like the light that we'll have is the lamb of god like we don't need a sun we don't need spotlights in the rafters because we will have the lamb himself and i'm gonna read the rest of that passage even though it's not going to be on your screen it says this 
It says, by its light, the light of the Lamb, the nations will walk. The kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nation. And then it says this, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. You follow Jesus, you're in the Lamb's book of life. This is what Revelation is teaching us. And we have this grand picture of the worship that we'll offer. Why? Because the Lamb died for us. That, those things we couldn't stop doing, those things that held us back, those things that we regret doing, those things that are causing us anxiety and insecurity and stress and frustration, those things that we do and we don't even know why we do them forgiven and gone, completely cast away, no longer impacting and infecting our lives. Man, we have forgiveness from the Lamb of God. Like this is something to celebrate, it's something to worship. And I know that I know that I know you got some regrets. I know that I know that there's some areas in your life you don't feel forgiven and probably you haven't forgiven yourself. Well, what if today was the day you got free? And what if today was the day that you finally understood exactly what happened and why it had to take such drastic measures from God because he loves you so deeply. Let's pray together. So just with heads bowed and eyes closed, we just settle in for just a few more minutes of quiet before the chaos of Thanksgiving hits our lives. <clears throat> and there's some of you, man, who recognize that you are not connected to the giver of life, to God, that you've blamed God for some things, you've tried to not believe God, but you know that you know today, man, that Jesus died for your sins and that you, have, you want to experience forgiveness. And the way that that happens is just by committing your life to follow him, believing that he died for your sins and following him. And if that's you today, if you're ready to take that step to experience the freedom that comes through forgiveness, man, if you're ready to experience the future and the hope that comes with those who know Jesus and follow Jesus, I'm just gonna encourage you to pray after me. Dear God, I am a sinner and I need forgiveness. I believe that Jesus shed his blood so that I could experience forgiveness. I trust him today and I will follow him. You know, when the Bible teaches us that when we pray that, when we begin to follow Jesus that our sins are forgiven, past, present, and future, every sin, every word, every thought, every action, everything is forgiven. If that was you today, if you raised your, if you, committed your life to follow Jesus, I just want to help you mark the moment just briefly today in the quietness of the moment. I'm going to invite you to raise your hand on the count of three. When I count of three, if you would just raise your hand, let's make eye contact just for you to mark the moment. One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now for others, it could be that you're just dealing with some, some sin, something that's happened, something that you've done. And you just can't seem to get past it or get over it. And you can't seem to find forgiveness for it. I'm, I'm just here today to tell you, based on God's word, that he wants to forgive you. That if you follow Jesus, he wants to forgive you. He wants to guard your mind. He wants to guard your heart. He wants to give you a new identity. And so maybe for you today, it's just to say, God, this is yours and not mine. I'm tired of hanging on to it. Try, tired of trying to prove something to somebody. And I'm not even sure what. Man, today's the day for you to do that in your own heart. You know, symbolically what you're doing is you have to ask yourself, hey, what did I put on those doorposts? What, what is up there? Is it the blood of Jesus or is it something else? And is it something else that I put up there? Expecting God to pass over me because of my good works or my good behavior because of my moral thinking and believing, none of that. The Bible says it's filthy rags because you don't need it. You just need the forgiveness that comes through Christ. Lord, I'm grateful that you point out sin, not to hold it against us, God, but to give us a solution, man, to give us the truth about what's holding us back, man, to help us understand the reality of the way the world works in a world that doesn't want to take responsibility, in a world that hates that word, in a word, world that would try to get the Christians to not talk about that word, God, that you bring forgiveness, that you offer a solution, that you're present in the middle of that. And God, I'm just grateful that there is no sin too bad. There's nothing that we've done that's gone too far to escape the sacrifice the Passover lamb at the cross. And we just claim that in our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, as we close out today, we want to <clears throat>
worship, but also we want to take communion. It seems only fitting that we would do that, obviously, with uh, talking about the sacrifice of Jesus. And I want to point out just a couple of things that hopefully will help you to see it a little differently um, for the rest of your life. <clears throat> Jesus was ce- celebrating the Passover just before he died. And he's celebrating it with his, his closest followers. And it says this, as he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten it, he said this, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Now, when Jesus does this, again, it's at Passover. And remember to celebrate Passover, what did you need? You needed a lamb. You needed a lamb. And there's no lamb mentioned on the menu. There is no lamb on the table. Why? Because the lamb's sitting at the table. Jesus is present as the lamb. So let's grab our uh, elements, if you would. You can peel off and take the bread out. He took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, and he said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He says, in the same way, he took the cup. He says, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And as often as you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. God, we're just grateful. God, help us to always have hearts of gratitude for the gospel. And for the sacrifice that was made that we would just always cling to, hang on to with ruthless tenacity that there is a God and he is good. And he proved it by sending his son to be a sacrifice, his one and only son, that we might have life. It's in Jesus' name we pray.